Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! There was drama in the House of Commons today when MPs from the Scottish National Party walked out en masse during Prime Minister's questions. They left after their leader was ordered out following a row with the Speaker over Scotland being sidelined in the Brexit debate. It came as Tory rebels who are pushing to keep closer ties with the EU said they feared the Prime Minister could betray them over assurances given to them yesterday over Brexit. Our political editor Laura Koonsberg was watching She is in Westminster for us now. Laura. Well, Sophie, take a deep breath, a very big deep breath. It's been a very busy day and a crazy day here in Westminster. Fury and a mass walkout from the SNP who were immediately accused of pulling a stunt. We've had different sides of the Tory party clashing with each other in public and the Labour Party, for good measure, divided over Brexit too. Some people would say this is part of the inevitable bumps in the road of a tricky process. But some MPs are privately using words like fiasco or even meltdown. Don't walk into the pillar. Farce. What promises have you made to the uh, Tory rebels? <laughs> a bit of pantomime. <laughs> it's a beautiful. I wanted a quiet walk to work. That's what I wanted. No, you might not be blamed for wondering if it looks a bit like that. But it's the woman who lives in Downing Street who's the one trying to keep it all together. Can you really please both sides, Prime Minister? She's the one trying to stick to promises that perhaps can't all be kept. But for Theresa May, it's certainly not a laughing matter. There may now be a meltdown. Yes. <laughs> They're not actually my words, but those of the Foreign Secretary. Even as his fellow Cabinet Ministers are preparing people for the government's negotiations. Joking apart, listen carefully. This is Theresa May committing to think again about giving Parliament more power if they vote down the eventual deal with the European Union. I have agreed this morning with the Brexit Secretary that we will bring forward an amendment in the Lords. But there are a number of issues, a number of things that will guide our approach in doing so. The Prime Minister made it to this morning, avoiding defeat last night because some of the wannabe rebels believe she made them a promise behind closed doors, that she'd change her plans for what happens if the final Brexit deal explodes. I trust the Prime Minister, and I know she will be true to her word. It would be a terrible betrayal if she weren't, and she is a woman of her word, and she's just given an absolute undertaking at the dispatch box. Job done. But in what feels like a game of she said, he said, not everyone's version of exactly what was promised is precisely the same. It will in the end be determined by what actually is conceded um, and it's too soon to tell. My fear, however, is that the damage, frankly, has already been done. The Tories are hardly talking each other's language, let alone the rest of ours. But what's happening is that the Prime Minister is trying to please a faction of her party who want Parliament to have more control if the final Brexit deal goes sour. But she also has to keep on board dozens of others who think if that happened, the best thing might be simply to walk away. But you can hardly please all of the people all of the time, even on your own side. The leader of the SNP in Westminster was cross too. Given the disrespect that shown. That last night, there were only minutes of debate about how Brexit affects Scotland. So he used dusty rules of the Commons to provoke a row. I order the right honourable gentleman to withdraw immediately from the House. Predictably thrown out by the Speaker. Very well. Applauded adoringly by his own side. We have had changes to the devolution settlement that were pushed through last night without Scottish MPs' voices being heard. That's a democratic outrage. Brexit's complicated, and that gives Theresa May's foes so many reasons to attack her. The Prime Minister is predictably, perhaps, struggling to contain every peck. Laura Koonsberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's speak to our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, who is in Glasgow. The walkout was certainly dramatic. Where does the row go now? 
Well, tonight, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been hinting this may not be the last time that the SNP use these kind of dramatic tactics to try and highlight what they describe as Westminster's power grab. She told the BBC that it can no longer be business as usual between the Scottish and the UK governments. Now, you heard Laura saying there that this parliamentary walkout by the SNP was dismissed by their opponents as a manufactured stunt. Well, it was undeniably an effective one. The SNP say they have gained over 1,000 new members just this afternoon since people in Scotland saw what was happening in the House of Commons this afternoon. So what is the row all about? Well, the SNP are furious, genuinely furious, that the House of Commons last night voted to impose the EU withdrawal bill in Scotland, despite the fact that the Scottish Parliament voted overwhelmingly last month to reject it. Now, this is the first time in nearly 20 years of devolution that Westminster has voted to overrule Holyrood like this. The SNP accept that legally there's nothing they can do about that, but they say that politically the battle will go on and that the UK government, if they proceed anyway, risk political consequences. Our oh, Scotland editor Sarah Smith, thank you. Now, the entire group of Scottish National Party MPs staged a walkout of Prime Minister's question time today in protest of what they said was a power grab by Westminster. The SNP claim that the government is keeping hold of powers that should go to Edinburgh after Brexit and were furious that they didn't get the chance to argue their case during the EU withdrawal bill debate. Away from all that, Tory rebel MPs and the government ministers have started negotiations on how to give Parliament a bigger say on any final Brexit deal. Gary Gibbon is in Westminster. Gary, yet another day of, uh, of trouble? Yes, both uh, in front of the cameras uh, and behind. As you said, the SNP had their walkout. I think originally they intended to force a vote to interrupt Prime Minister's questions, but uh, the Speaker's ruling changed all that. Events got on top of them and there was a walkout. Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister, is saying it can no longer be business as usual with the UK government. Behind the scenes, we've got the... Uh, sequel to yesterday's drama uh, when the government compromised with the backbench pro-Remain rebel army under Dominic Grieve and what they've had to do today is try and work out what that compromise looks like. Uh, what Dominic Grieve was looking for in his original amendment that he wanted to put uh, uh, before the House was uh, a, a, an agreement that the Commons would have a veto if it didn't like the way the Brexit deal or lack of a deal was going in the autumn of this year. The government's got to come up with something that looks an awful lot like that. Uh, there's been an awful lot of flurry around today suggesting those talks are going badly. I've talked to people who came out of the talks, which lasted about an hour and a half, uh, uh, and I saw them just over an hour ago. They seem to think it's not going that badly, though it's not sorted yet. The plan is to get that amendment, the new comprom compromise amendment, out tonight. Ministers this morning were asked to spell out what concessions had been given to pro-Remain rebels. Does this kill the no-deal Brexit? I think it was a mistake to walk to work. <laughs> it's a beautiful... I wanted a quiet walk to work, that's what I wanted. This response won't have soothed Remainer nerves. What promises have you made to the uh, Tory rebels? <laughs> Remainers say Theresa May personally promised a lot more than that just before the vote last night when they stood down their rebel troops. The Prime Minister. Prime Minister's questions were stalled for a while as the SNP's leader in Westminster protested at what he called a Brexit power grab by the government and the lack of time to debate it. He tried a rarely used bit of procedure to try to break up the session. Given the disrespect that's shown, I have got no option but to ask that this House now sits in private. Not now. That is the end of the matter. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, might I ask... No, no, I'm not going No, resume your seat. Resume your seat. It was a ploy originally planned for last night. Then Ian Blackford refused instructions to sit down. The Speaker banned him from Parliament for the day. SNP MPs walked out behind him in solidarity. Some waved goodbye. Tories shouted bye. One SNP MP shouted back, you lot are a total disgrace. I'm not walking out. I have been suspended from Parliament. The SNP said it was no longer business as usual with the UK government. Holyrood had been overruled and then debate in Westminster stifled.
I mean, it was a stunt. You just said no, it, was a, a it was a justified stunt. No, it's not a stunt. You this can't is argue serious. it was a stunt. No, that, look, this is actually really Anybody serious. But sometimes when you're getting publicity money can't buy, it's hard to hide your delight. So as politicians wrangle over the Brexit details, what do people away from Westminster make of its progress two years on from the referendum? Our North of England correspondent Claire Fallon is in Brexit-backing Blackpool to find out. She is on the prom right now. Claire. Well, Blackpool is your typical British seaside resort. We've got fish and chips, amusement arcades. We even had a bit of sun earlier today. In the 10 years before the referendum, about £25 million in EU money was spent here. And you can see it on the promenade. But walk a couple of minutes in that direction and you find the boarded up buildings and the patches of wasteland. The big political parties stopped coming here a long while ago for their conferences and some people here still feel like that was the powerful turning their backs on them. And so when Blackpool voted to leave the European Union, in some ways they were sending out a message to the decision makers in London, a message of, hi, remember us, we're still here. Looking for cliches about Brexit, you'll find them all in Blackpool. Twists and turns, ups and downs, winners and losers. But forget the cliches, forget the notion Vote Leave was all about small-minded, small towns. Vote Leave, vote change, vote stick a spanner in Whitehall's works. The reasons were as complex as the negotiations. No, this lady was sitting, I joined her, and this lady just came in in the middle. We don't know each other at all. At the Winter Gardens, where Churchill, Thatcher and Blair all came to sell their visions, I met Mandy, Dorothy and Pat, much. here for the Pensioners' Parliament. Yes. They're two to one, out to in, the same way the town as a whole was split at the referendum. I'd just like them to get on with it. I mean, I think when we voted, we didn't realise there was going to be all this um, no. argy-bargy, really. No, we didn't. And Pat came to Blackpool for a weekend 45 years ago. She's been here ever since. It's supposed to go to Blackpool for a stick of rock, not a husband. You know. <laughs> you she wanted to stay in the EU. Now she wants them to crack on with it. It's, nothing seems to be happening. It's taken too long to get to this stage. They need to speed things up a bit. Back when Blackpool was conference town, politicians came year in, year out, bringing millions to the resort. The world needs Britain, and Britain needs us. That was then, and this is now. So they're doing up the Winter Gardens, in part thanks to EU funding. But for the politicians, for more than a decade, it's been Manchester, Birmingham and Liverpool, places with more five-star hotels. Blackpool scores badly when it comes to deprivation. There are more heroin deaths in the town than anywhere else. But round these parts, they also talk about the Brexit bounce. The drop in the value of the pound after the referendum meant a pound went further if you holidayed at home. The reverse is true, though, if you're buying, say, a roller coaster from Germany. At the Pleasure Beach, their new ride opened last month. Ordered before the Brexit vote, paid for after, it ended up costing them a million more. In a town famous for its illuminations, this family-run firm started as a seafront light shop. Now a global business selling to hotels and cruise liners. Import and export is key. Mustn't vibrate, mustn't yeah. swing, mustn't move. The father and son in charge told me they need certainty. If you end up with a fudge, then those people outside the EU who want to set up new trade deals with us really feel they can't because we're still in the, in the EU. But if we're halfway in and out, those in the EU will still count as us not within the EU. So we're not pleasing them and we're not pleasing them. And uh, in, in the middle is no man's land. I guess this uncertainty, this particular this political friction, causes um, a lack of confidence in all markets, really. And um, that's the only thing that can be detrimental to our business. But that's not our business exclusively. That's to any business, I think. Tucked away in a corner of the workshop, I found Billy. Blackpool is known as a town full of runaways, where people come to escape their troubles. Instead, Billy came for love. I moved here for a woman. Romantic. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah hopeless romantic. <laughs> and also, on Brexit, optimistic. I'm hopeful for it, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, nothing's going to stay the same forever. 
in my eyes. It's, if, it has to, if you have to change, somebody has to make that right direction. And if they think that this is the, right, the way we can move on as a, a country and everything, then you have to move with it. So back to the Brexit cliches. Yes, there will be plenty more ups and downs. But in places like this, where they voted to leave, there's a genuine sense of hope for the future. They want Brexit to bring opportunity. They also want the politicians to get on with it. Claire Fallon, Channel 4 News, in Blackpool. The walkout of the Scottish National Party MPs from today's Prime Minister's questions after the expulsion of the parliamentary leader by the Speaker may have been prearranged, but it doesn't alter the fact that the deliberations over Brexit are becoming more fraught and, as far as the Scottish Government's concerned, an existential threat to devolution. Simply put, the Scottish Government believes that Theresa May is intent on keeping powers repatriated after, Brestwick, well, after Brexit to Westminster, including over agriculture and fisheries, rather than devolving them to the Scottish Parliament. Our political editor, Nick Watt, is here. Nick, you know, it was a, a, a bit of actually quite a drama in this kind of slightly kind of endless conversation about Brexit. But there was a serious point here. Yes, I mean, underlying this row is the absolute fury in the SNP that this Brexit legislation appears to be heading to the statute book mm -hmm. without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Now, the reason why Holyrood has withheld that um, is um, because um, they fear this so-called power grab, which mm -hmm. is that London is taking back some, but not all the powers that are currently held in Brussels that are in devolved areas. Now, the UK government says they have to do it because in, in those rather limited areas they are related to the functioning of the UK single market. So as you were saying, Ian Blackford, the SNP leader at Westminster, he decided to take a stand and his particular reason was that there were only around 11 minutes allowed in Tuesday's debate to discuss those areas on devolved areas and they're saying that really does show Westminster's very high-handed view towards Hollywood. So uh, today, more votes, the government got through these votes, but it did actually mask a deeper problem. That's right. I mean, this bill no, now goes back to the House of Lords with no government defeats. And crucially, the government won a vote on whether the UK should go into the European Economic Area, which would be membership as a single market, and that was voted down. But interestingly, 14 Conservative MPs either abstained or voted in favour of that. Now... 14 is the magic number that if you have 14 Tory rebels and you have the Labour front bench voting for something, then the government could be defeated. But Jeremy Corbyn ordered his troops to abstain on this one because he doesn't believe that we should be in the EEA. But there are going to be some votes next month on taking the UK into the EEA. And I spoke to one ally of Jeremy Corbyn this evening who said, we have got to get him to change his mind, although this person said, not holding their breath. Well, I've got Emily Thornbury later, and I'm, I'll probably put that straight to her. But where are we in the so-called role of Parliament on these negotiations? Very much the Dominic Grieve position. Well, the Conservative mediator-in-chief, Oliver Letwin, has been summoned, and he's trying to find common ground between Dominic Grieve, the Remainer-in-chief, who wants to give Parliament a really decisive role in those sort of final uh, hours, final months of the Brexit negotiations, between him and the Prime Minister, who says, I hear what you're saying, but we cannot have Parliament directing the government. Uh, and uh, both sides are saying that they think there may be some common ground tonight. But I spoke to two cabinet ministers and they said to me, we're just trying to find whether Dominic Grieve really has that many supporters. Perhaps we're going to peel off some of his supporters. But one of those said to me, the government can bleep off. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP, J Jacob rees -Mogg. Good evening to Good you. Good evening. Uh, let's just start uh, with the uh, agreement with the rebel remainers. What's it all about? Well... I think the um, Hailsham Amendment that was passed in the Lords that requires a meaningful vote mm -hmm. actually doesn't get them anywhere because the basic constitutional position is that the government negotiates treaties but can only do so if it maintains the confidence of the House of Commons and that the result of any agreement will have to be brought into law, which means it has to pass through the House of Commons. So without any of this, the House of Commons always 
has the fate of the government of the day in its hands. That is our routine yes, constitutional position. and the fate position. of the government of the day is only in, through the vote of no confidence. So you're not really bothered about any concessions given to the Remainers. You're not bothered about that. The issue with these concessions is that they actually make no deal more likely because they would so gum up the process of negotiation. Can you imagine that the government goes off to Brussels and says we can only discuss these three things because these are the only ones that have been covered by a House of Commons resolution. The EU says no. The EU it goes, says get lost. It goes back to the Commons. A week passes. Another resolution is passed. So it means nothing let's will just be quite. Let's just be quite clear on this. That it's actually, you think it's more likely that there will be uh, no deal, but actually... You are actually not that bothered about the, no deal, are you? No, I want a deal. I think a deal is our, in our interests, but I'm not frightened of no deal. Right. And I think it's very important in any negotiation that your starting point should be that, yes, we want a deal, but that we're happy not to have a deal so, in the second, if the, the deal is not good so enough. So, basically, your position still is uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. Absolutely. So, let's, let's just move forward quite clearly on this. If the deal that Theresa May negotiates is a bad deal, would you just have to live with it? I think that no deal is better than a bad deal. Would you live with a bad deal? I would not support a bad deal. Of course I wouldn't. Right. So in what way... This is, but this that's is the, the key point. point. No, 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 no. This is the key point here. It's all about I wouldn't support a bad deal. I would. How would you not support a bad deal? What would you actually do? Oh, that's the key. Yes. That a bad deal or good deal requires legislation. And yep. MPs vote on legislation. So any deal that the Prime Minister gets, this is what makes the Hailsham Amendment only a risk of no deal. It doesn't change or enhance the constitutional position that any deal requires legislation. And any MP who doesn't like the deal, whether it's Dominic Grieve on his side uh -huh. or me on my side, can vote against the legislation. That is the normal constitutional procedure. The normal constitutional procedure would be, though, if I'm not right, if I'm not wrong, is that... You, a deal comes before, you think that it's not up to Parliament to negotiate well, I mean, the deal, it's up to Theresa yes. May. She brings back a deal that you don't think is a good deal, and in order to kill that deal, the only thing open to you, if I'm right, is a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister. No, that's not right. You vote to amend the legislation implementing the deal. So, therefore, you have a situation... Let me give you a specific example. So, you wait a minute. Well, let's be quite clear. I'm not clear, because you do not believe that it's Parliament that negotiates this deal, it's the Prime Minister. But then you're, on the other hand, saying, in the same way that Dominic, Dominic Grieve's saying, that you would amend the legislation, but, but you don't believe is... a parliamentarian's job is to no, amend no, no, this no, no, legislation. No, 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 not this legislation, the implementing legislation. That how treaties work is that the government signs the treaty... And yeah. then the effects in domestic law have to be brought into law through an act of Parliament. Which you would so, fight if you thought it was so a bad deal. So let me give you a specific example. If the government comes back in October mm -hmm. and says we are giving £39 billion to the European Union, yeah. but we haven't got any promises on trade other than their good faith, I think it's very unlikely people would vote for that. You would vote against it? Well, if that's what they came back with, I would not support that. You would vote against it? I would vote against it. it. So you can... Look at specific right. examples okay. where the legislation would be impossible to get well, through. But, th and but, that therefore... is your, but that is your view, with the same way that Dominic Grieve has his view. So we're in the same position, just from different wings mm. of the Brexit vote. Or under what circumstances, because you, you have talked about this in the Times, simply put, would you ever bring a vote of no confidence against Theresa May? Oh, I won't support a vote of no confidence in Theresa May. You won't support it and you wouldn't bring it yourself? No, no, of course I'm not going to bring a vote of no confidence right. in Theresa May. I support the government and I'm expecting to support the deal. Because the great thing about the government is it's got an excellent chief whip who can count and he knows perfectly well that he cannot pass into domestic legislation a rotten deal. So um, there's no circumstances, even if it's a rotten deal and it does somehow get passed, and we talked about the tightness of the figures there, let's just be quite clear, there's no way that you would take part in any activity to bring Theresa May down. The, the Fixed Term Parliament Act sets out how a vote of confidence yes. works. Let me be absolutely clear, I will not support any vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister under the Fixed Term Parliament Act. I have confidence in her, I support her, and I'm expecting her to get an excellent deal. And if she doesn't, then... I will support you... her, but there will be legislation which will be open for debate. And Dominic Grieve and I could, will both be debating it. Thank you both very much. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, Jacob rees -Mogg. And we're joined tonight by Andrew Pearce and you. Kevin Maguire. Hello Hi. to you both. Um, chaos in the Commons today. Yeah. Uh, a mass revolt 
Well, it's the headline it's in the Times. It's Labour's Labour. turn for today. A, for a self-inflicted punishment beating. Because yesterday the uh -huh. Tories were all, out, were all were on the ropes. Now, this is... The, the, it is, as I thought, probably the biggest rebellion of his leadership. 90 Labour MPs, 75 voted for the European Economic Area, 15 uh, uh, voted against. The Labour position was abstain. It, this is essentially uh, uh, what the, the approach to the EU that Norway has. It would have kept... Uh, the, let, if, if it was accepted, it means we keep, we keep free movement of people, which is a big no-no for people who voted Single for market, Brexit. Lots of trade, Single market, jobs, but, but we don't yeah. want all that uh, EU immigration. Mm -hmm. So also six uh, front benches resigned. One was in, one was a shadow minister. Five parliamentary aides gone. That's now over a hundred uh, Labour front benches have quit since Corbyn became leader. Uh, and you know he's always going to be tricky for Corbyn to appeal to his MPs to be loyal to his leadership, because mm. why should they? Because when he was a backbencher, he was the most disloyal of them all. Over 580 rebellions, I think, against the Labour front bench as a backbencher. The joke used to be he voted against um, the Labour Party more often than David Cameron did. Uh, so it's a grim day for them, uh, and uh, uh, it's the biggest revolt since airstrikes in Syria in 2015. And it just shows that on the front bench of both Labour and the Tories, there's utter disarray. It's true, and that's why we should have trust the great British people to vote on the deal and have a people's vote at the end. But no, it was Labour. Labour was all over the place uh, today. The sp splits have been brutally exposed. They were yesterday in the Cons Conservative Party with the resignation too of a minister, um, I know, to uh, to abstain. Uh, but it was La but it was Labour's turn, and. Uh, yeah. It's, it'll hurt Corbyn that, but he's out of step with his voters, his members, most of his MPs who want a f more pro-European position than, uh, than he's currently adopting. I don't know how he puts it back together. I suppose what Labour's done in the past just moved on. He, he had a good he, Prime Minister's Questions, but there was good. a surprise at Prime Minister's Questions, wasn't there? Uh, the Daily Express, uh, two pages on this, the SNP walkout. Yeah, C Corbyn did very well because he put... May on the spot on Europe. Later, later on, of course, this happened. He could have you know, been put on the spot himself. But no, the SNP walkout after Ian Blackford was raising uh, and, and challenging the fact there's only about 20 minutes being given to uh, a debate uh, on, uh, on the implications for directly for Scotland. Now, if this wasn't staged, he stumbled <laughs> into it. It was it, staged. It looked, it looked staged... Uh, to me, and it sounded staged. He, didn't, he denies it. He denies it was staged. Well, he, he, he does. Well, he would, wouldn't he? Does. he? But it's uh, in that in that case you've walked into it. I'm not sure that's uh, it's, particularly but, good. But this is the first time Blackford has really made any impact because he's the new leader of the SNP in Parliament. Because the previous West guy, Minister, uh, Angus yeah. what was Robertson, name? Robertson yeah. was highly effective, very very good in the Commons Chamber, regularly uh, jousted well with Mrs May. He's been ineffective. Uh, so this was a clever PR stunt. Uh, it's got them massive publicity, especially in Scotland, and it is because they're objecting to the amount of time Scotland's been given in this debate over the EU. Yeah, yeah. and he describes the devolution amendments to the Brexit bill last night as a power grab. He's saying yeah. that issues that are currently decided in Brussels will come back to Westminster. And he wants yeah. to, to go to Edinburgh. Yeah. I understand his point, and there, there is something to it, so it's open for debate. And, of course, Scotland voted to remain, and it's a... You know, it's, it's an, it's a nationalist party. He doesn't really care what uh, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. He is is focused on uh, on Scotland. He's representing Scotland as he sees it. So, and he, he's saying there are issues that that could take seven years for Holyrood to get mm. reclaim power on. Seven? I mean, that might be optimistic. I mean, look, Brexit. Brexit's turning out to be not a shambles. Nobody knows where we're going. Uh, Government split, the main opposition split. The SNP are pretty united. Lib Liberal Democrats are pretty united. DUP, pretty united. The one Green MP, she's united with herself. But you know, for a, a Parliament is all over on this. It's, yeah. it's kind of absolutely people, people appear, fascinating. Where, people, whether they voted to leave or remain, I just must be thinking, what the hell? I've been